Um, hope everyone's well today. I'm really excited to be here today talking about one of my favorite topics. Um, I just was realizing time flies and it's already uh, almost Labor Day and I've been in my current role as Deputy Director for Management at the Office of Management and Budget for six months. Um, and time flies when you're having fun. A lot of people hear that very long title, it's a mouthful and don't really understand, you know, what, what do you do all day? Um, so simply put, I'm responsible for uh, many of the things that help government run that nobody wants to think about. So IT, um, cyber, finance, accounting, procurement. I've also got the USDS team um, as part of my group and we're responsible for policy and uh, creating capabilities for the whole of government that help us drive the agenda of government forward. And when I got here, I was charged with the task of looking at what is the president's management agenda going to be for this administration. And, and you know, you've all been here in Washington probably longer than I have. Um, I got here just under a year ago. And I've spent my career in the private sector working largely in financial technology, looking at large transformational change projects. And I wanted to start with a customer-centric view of what did we need to do in government. And to do that, I actually went all the way back to the beginning to say, what is our government supposed to be about? And conveniently, we have this document called the Constitution that lays that out for us. It says, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, preserve the blessings of liberty. That's what we're here to do. That's what government does. And most Americans actually think we should be doing that. There's some disagreement around the edges politically about how much the federal government should do versus states, but fundamentally the American people think we should be doing this stuff. The challenge is that most Americans don't actually think we're doing a good job at delivering those services. They actually think that government is not trustworthy to do many of the things we all know that the government is supposed to do. And writ large, trust in the US federal government is at the lowest point it has been in measurement history. The apex was right after World War II, where it was a clear alignment around mission, what we were doing, how we were doing it, and how much we needed to invest in, in doing that mission. Today, there's a lot less clarity. And so what I've put up on the slides here is the perspective of when we really looked at why is it difficult to run government like a business, to be more efficient, to be more effective, to steward our resources in a much better way, there were three things that jumped out at me. This group is not gonna be surprised to find out that IT and ancient IT systems were part of the problem. Assembler code, anyone? We still have it, right? IRS still has assembler code. They're talking about changing it now. The last time in the private sector I dealt with assembler code was in 1999 at Visa credit card system where they were migrating um, a little bit of a while ago to um, more modern technologies. So we've got these moribund technologies. We've got all these challenges. We know cybersecurity is a major challenge. But I'm not saying anything people around here didn't know. There's a reason why this is difficult. There's structural challenges to getting investments in the right place. And luckily, folks here, um, folks on my team that were here before I was here, were working with Congress on the Modernizing Government Technology Act and actually did some things that we got passed into law last year in terms of creating the Technology Modernization Fund and putting working capital funds in play that would allow for multi-year investments around technology. So that was a great first start and, and um, you've all seen and heard a lot of things that we've been doing on that front. But that isn't enough to actually get the traction that we need to make the change across government. The second challenge we saw was even understanding the nature of the investment challenge that we have is a real problem because data is not uniform and it's not well understood in a technological sense across government. So when I say big data here in Washington, I was very surprised to learn 
that that meant different things to every audience I spoke to. If I said it to somebody who does, does policy, big data meant analytics for public policy purposes. If I said big data to somebody who was in management, they were talking about performance metrics. If I said it to Congress, they were talking about accountability and transparency. But when I say big data in the private sector, it means all data, all sources, all uses. It means taxonomy, hygiene, APIs, common data standards, clear architectural vision for how we think about data. And nobody was talking about that. And we certainly weren't investing in that. So data is the second major pillar of the president's management agenda designed to really start getting traction on how do we do this. And finally, and this may not be a surprise to many of you who have been looking at government technology for a long time, but it was a surprise to me. When I got here, I expected there would be robotic process automation projects going six ways to Sunday. Because the world I came from in the private sector, those were the easiest projects to focus on because they were low cost from a capital expenditure standpoint and very quick return. So using software robotics to automate low value functions, particularly manual processing functions, those are really high return projects. But in the public sector, we have a challenge and it's a combination challenge that is rooted in a very old workforce policy codified in the Civil Service Reform Act with very good intentions in 1978, building on law that was, was developed first in 1923 and then updated in 1949, all predating agile development, all predating the way we work today. And so modernizing and updating how we think about our workforce is also critical. And the goal is not to use robotics to replace people, but to shift people to higher value work. Um, I, I'll give an example. Um, the first time I interacted um, with the Social Security Administration, I went online. I did self-service to research what I was looking for. And then I went in person at an appointed time, waited only 10 minutes, and met with a human being to deal with the survivor benefits for my children. So it was a stressful time, and it was a very human time where I met with a human being who knew everything that I was dealing with. And she said, your children's checks from their father will be in the mail in three weeks. That was a profound experience and an example of how government could and should work, but doesn't always work. Now, had their father been able to access those benefits directly through such a simple, seamless solution, possibly you know, the outcomes um, even from, from his health would have been different. But at the end of the day, working across these components, IT, data, and people are how we really change the modernization narrative. And I painted it as gears because if we don't have them all working together, they can get stuck. And the best investments, the best thinking can grind to a halt. And that's why I don't talk about IT modernization in isolation. In the remaining time I have, I want to also talk about the journey that we're on. So a lot of what I've talked about starts with this president's management agenda vision. My experience from the private sector that I think translates into the public sector is it helps if everyone knows where we're going and why we're going there. You know, so mission, service, and stewardship are why we're going there. And IT modernization, data transparency and accountability, and people in the workforce for the 21st century, these are the mechanisms of what we're doing. And then the vehicles for change are going to evolve. They start with the three things that I just talked about. They use something that we call the cross-agency priority goals. Has anyone ever heard of those before? Cross-agency priority goals? Essentially, they're things we track quarterly, so we measure. We have modest investments that we can put towards pilot projects around specific goals that 
feed into this broader vision and that we use all of government um, resources, both career and political staff at multiple levels in government to be part of working groups that are actually doing pilots in shared services, in um, creating new data standards, new uh, transparency standards, working on TBM, working on cybersecurity. So we're actually making real down payments on these objectives that we're talking about. And I'd encourage you to check out www.performance.gov, where we track all these cross-agency priority goals. And you can see them. And they get updated quarterly. They were most recently updated in June. Uh, so I guess that means the, the next update is coming up in September. Building on that, though, we're trying to make profound structural changes as well. There's a lot of things we're doing on the regulatory front. Um, there have been a lot of things you've probably seen on the two for one front. We're looking at things that go deeper, that look at things like the Computer Matching Act and says, OK, are there regulations in place that make it difficult for us to do this modernization business? Are there things around getting input from the, the um, the customer base that are difficult because of Paperwork Reduction Act? Are there other regs like our um, human resources regs that get in the way? We're looking at that. Our reorganization plan, um, a lot of people made a lot of noise about all the, the box moving. But some of the changes I'm most excited about were standing up a new capability around customer experience, end-to-end -end customer centered design focus. Um, so you'll be hearing more about that. We're also going to be standing up something that we've put an RFI out around the GEAR Center. So Government Effectiveness Advanced Research Center. It's going to be a public-private partnership where we're going to try to bring the best thinking from universities, from the private sector, and from government to solve some of these intractable problems and make investments in them. We're going to continue to work on some of the things around funding and look for new operating models, look for new incentives, look for new ways that we can shift one-year money to multi-year money and pre provide incentives for people to do the right thing with their money. Ultimately, this is a journey that we expect is going to take much longer than one administration. Changing a culture of one-year funding and management by statute won't change overnight. But we're trying to build through the combination of big picture vision and concrete action and measurable progress to make people believe that this profound change that we need is really possible. And I view all of you as part of the community that can make that possible. Every time we say, no, we can't do that because we're taking a step away from the art of the possible. We're taking air out of that realm of possibility that says, how might we make this government work the way my son, who's 17 years old, my son, who's 14 years old, expect this government to work? And how do we make it work better for all of the Americans, whether they live in big cities or rural communities, as we embrace new technologies like robotics, like AI, like the Internet of Things. To do that, we have to fundamentally transform how we think about the business of government and management of IT. And so I appreciate your help and your willingness to be part of that journey with us. With that, I thank you very much.